started with introductions and then we will go into our workshop. Thank you to everyone that is joining us today and good afternoon and welcome to Uptown Forward, Uptown Consortium's virtual work workshop sponsored by PNC. The Uptown Forward program provides education and assistance to help Uptown small businesses and organizations build a digital presence amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. As we approach the winter months and the increase of COVID-19 cases, this assistance is needed now more than ever, and we are happy to provide a free walk workshop to the entire Uptown community. Again, thank you for joining us. Today's presentation will be led by industry experts, Pixels and Dots, and Reverb Art and Design. This two-hour workshop will cover a variety of topics, including brand development, messaging, community engagement, social media, digital advertising, search engine optimization, SEO, and e-commerce. Before I kick it over to our industry experts, I would like to take a moment to introduce them. Monty Davis serves as Vice President of Pixels and Dots, where he has provided a wide range of creative design and digital marketing services to Cincinnati businesses for more than 20 years to help businesses stand out and grow. Monty recently completed the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program and the SBA Emerging Leaders Program. If you wanna give a wave, Monty. Awesome. Leo DeCruz serves as co-founder and chief strategic officer of Reverb, where he is an experienced communication strategist based in Cincinnati. As chief strategic officer and a founding partner at Reverb, Leo heads up communications, both on the written page and through public engagement. If you wanna give a little wave, Leo. Michelle DeCruz serves as co-founder and CEO of Reverb, where she holds a deep rooted belief that the status quo is meant to be challenged and that thoughtful design can help drive communities forward. She is an artist by nature, creative strategist by profession and advocate for equitable outcomes by necessity. Reverb will present for the first hour today and Pixels and Dots will present for the second. I know many of you watching are running small businesses, nonprofits and have a very busy schedule. We understand you may be multitasking while tuning in and we are just glad you are here to take yourself and your business or organization to a new place. Many of you submitted questions in advance of today that will be covered throughout the presentations, but feel free to use the chat box or Q&A at the bottom of your screen to ask questions as we will have five minutes at the end of each presentation for Q&A. And then we'll get started. So I'm gonna kick it over to Michelle and Leo for you all to share your screen. Thank you so much, Brooke. Uh, we really appreciate the invitation to be here as well as folks attending just so we can share our experience and start some great conversations about small business development and emerging your brand. Um, tell you, to tell you a little bit about Reverb as a firm, uh, we often joke that who we are is synchronous with what we do. Um, and I think that tends to be the case with a lot of emerging businesses. As an organization, Reverb was created to utilize design thinking and social innovation practices to help move conversations forward on a community level. We work with um, a lot of nonprofits, small businesses, and public institutions to really drive um, conversations that promote community and intention and community design as the cornerstone of outreach and development for firms and products that are offered. We work with communities um, on the ground level every day and integrate them into the design process in order to determine um, jointly what solutions can be made. We wanted to kick things off today by talking a little bit about the developing of one's brand. Now, I know oftentimes this can, be, can end up feeling fairly overwhelming for folks. Um, a lot of pressure goes into developing your name and getting it right on the first, getting it right um, as you launch your brand. So we broke it down into three key con considerations to talk through today. The first is audience. Um, when we talk about audience, it, it isn't as simple as saying who's going to come across your brand. Rather, it's determining who are the core constituents that you want to be fully engaged in your brand. In order to develop your messaging and develop your visual strategy, you first need to understand who are you trying to reach and um, asking yourself what truly motivates them and also how they both best access and receive information. T 
tone is the secondary component. And tone encompasses both the visuals as well as the personality as a whole. And my colleague Leo will speak more about messaging in a moment, but when we talk about tone here, it's really saying, what is the overall um, personality? That comes down to the colors you choose. It comes down to the how simple or straightforward your name is and what you're trying to evoke in people's mind when they hear it. The design aesthetic as a whole, all of these factor in. Um, something we always like to talk about or talk about with our clients is, if you consider at a glance, somebody comes across your brand or comes across a snapshot material of a one pager or a website, in the moment that they have, let's say three seconds to engage with your brand, what is it that they're going to take from that? What will they learn and derive based on that snapshot glance of what you've put out into the world? Um, and also, what assumptions would be made based on your brand in that moment? Accessibility is the third key factor of that we really lift up as being crucial in determining your brand and developing it. Uh, accessibility can mean many things. What we are speaking to here is both how easily understood and interpreted your message and your service offerings are, but then also from a visual standpoint, how easy is it for folks to actually contend with it? So I'll, I'll share two case studies that we've, we've um, worked on over the years with clients just to help unpack a little bit of that as we go. The first one is a brand execution that was pursued for NSC, which is the National Student Clearinghouse. National Student Clearinghouse is a, an organization, a nonprofit that aggregates student data for the entire US. Typically it serves schools and higher education um, institutions. They came to us because they realized that um, over the course of years that they've been operation, their, their work is phenomenal and their, the data that they provide is incredible, but folks didn't often know how to, how to actually engage with their brand. Um, it wasn't memorable to them for a lot of folks when they did uh, marketing outreach and community-based conversations, they thought it was outdated and thought, if you are an aggregator of data, in today's technological world and you feel outdated, we don't feel like we have trust in that. So we worked with them to determine what their key messaging factors were. And they, it came down to trust. They wanna be seen as trustworthy. They want to be seen as reliable, as, as secure, and also as mission driven. So the style board you have in front of you starts to break down uh, visually how we respond to those needs and how we consider those across the board. Color palette is a great starting point. When talking about education, oftentimes primary colors come to mind. We wanted to use the familiar, but then elevate it so that it became more current and more contemporary. So we started with the primary colors of red, yellow, and blue, and the secondary of green, but then we shifted them. We made them brighter in tone, a little bit more um, engaging from the aspect of what's going to play well on social media, what will play well in print. And then we shifted them just slightly so it felt new. When we talk about data and data, um, oftentimes there are very straightforward interpretations that involve grids and numbers. And we wanted to, again, take that further. And so our style board starts taking the grid and skewing it. You'll see in the upper left corner when we talk about being the source, it's the grid with added complexity. In other aspects, we start using connectors and lines that are dissected from grid elements to create design, design accents for their brand. And then you have the idea of reliability and trust. We wanted every person that was portrayed within their brand to be forward facing or at least square on in the face so that you know there's nothing hidden. They're accessible, they are personable, they are relatable, and also very warm. Here's an example of how it, the visuals have started to come together since then. Um, again, the language is very direct, actionable, accessible. The tone overall is warm, but with these added design elements that really bring it all together. The next example is one that was actually done locally as a collaborative effort with Artworks. Reverb worked with Artworks to um, actually work with 12 
local young adults. Um, it was a collaborative process, a community engaged process that took seven weeks of meeting every day on the ground. We worked with the youth to help determine how to best reach their peers um, around to engage around topics of voting. It was a community led process where they determined every aspect of it with us supporting them. So what you see in front of them in front of you is first the idea of names, how important names are. The name Hear Me Out, if I'm completely transparent, is not one that I would have chosen for this project if it were for someone my age. But I think that's the key here. We worked with 12 young adults who were able to say, at the end of the day, what is the most important thing they wanna say about voting and voting engagement? It's hear me out, I have something to say. So really having, making sure the community was part of that process allowed us to determine a brand that was youth forward and youth centric at the same time. The visuals, what we learned through the process is that um, I'll read you this quote in the lower left. This came from directly from one of the participants. If I don't show up to vote, then I'm guaranteeing that people who don't look like me are making decisions on behalf of people who look like me. That really summarizes the approach that the team took. Um, what they told us is at the end of the day, if we're trying to reach people our age to say, get involved in the process, this needs to look like it came from us and it's for us. We wanna see ourselves reflected within the book. So the brand here ended up being very, very youth friendly. They wanted hand-drawn elements um, that felt like they had been touched on a personal level by their peers. They wanted images reflected that looked like them, that reflected the diversity of folks across the city of Cincinnati. The colors, they wanted to make sure that they were both warm and soothing, but also had elements that of pop that would get people's attention if they're scrolling through a feed online. Or, or going through a book. And then accessibility. Accessibility uh, meant that every page was reviewed to say, is it clearly scannable at a glance? Can we take away the key points? If somebody spends one minute with this book, will they get the central point of what's important? Can they read it easily? Are fonts legible? Even if we have hand-drawn elements, can the type be read? And then colors is everything easy on the eyes, are the contrast levels high enough? Um, are we considering our audience at the core and writing it in a style that directly speaks to the audience at hand? So I wanted to go ahead and pause for a moment and reintroduce my colleague, Leo. He will be taking us forward to talk more about messaging. Take it away, Leo. And Leo, I'll just flag if I could. I believe you're still muted. The eternal problem with Zoom. There it is. Um, okay, so starting over. Thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate that. Uh, so three basic elements to messaging. And, and I want to say framing this messaging is a very large uh, puzzle to solve. And uh, these are only three very top line uh, takeaways that I would love for folks to be able to uh, carry with you uh, away from this conversation today. So the first thing is speak like a human. And the second thing is show, don't tell. Uh, the third is say something true. And these all sound kind of straightforward and they are, but they take practice, they take work. And so what do, we, what do I mean by any one of these? Well, taking the first one, speak like a human. Again, this sounds like, well, we all talk to each other. We all write emails to each other every single day. How hard could that be? It's actually really, really hard. Um, and, you know, I'll just use myself as an example. When I came out of graduate school, I was used to long sentences, complex thought processes that didn't really translate the ideas that I, I wanted to get across to people um, in a communications setting uh, very easily. Michelle was actually really good at acting as guardrails for me and saying like, Leo, that doesn't mean anything. And I'm like, it means something up here, but it, it doesn't mean anything in the dynamic between myself and others. So one of the key aspects is when you're talking or writing, try not to use jargon. Jargon is inherently 
it's part of an internal conversation. It's not meant for broader audiences. And when a client, regardless of what, whatever business or nonprofit space uh, one is in, when a, when a client or what we can conceive of as the client is in front of you, they don't know the jargon. They just want a product, for example, or they have a need that they think you can meet, um, thinking about nonprofit uh, settings. So don't use jargon, use plain language, speak simply. Uh, the other thing is uh, don't use long ideas, don't string many ideas together. Um, you wanna be brief because we always, and this is actually a cue, we always walk away from conversa conversation saying, oh, I wish I had mentioned this as well. And what's, what, what we should take away from that is we don't converse with long ideas strung together we don't do well with retaining information that is um, you know, deeply complex unless we're gonna sit with it, usually in writing uh, for longer periods of time to allow us to digest it. So be brief. Think about what the key message takeaways are. Speak like a human, show don't tell, say something true and run with those and trust that that message is gonna be, you're gonna be able to deliver that message and that it will be received. Um, another thing with speaking like a human is be relatable. Now, again, this is in that space of like, aren't, well, aren't we all always relatable? And maybe, maybe some of us are really good at it. I'm actually uh, quite an introvert, so I'm not naturally or inherently good at being relatable. I can come off as aloof when my uh, guard is down. Um, and that aloofness can sometimes be taken for arrogance, which is not how I see myself. So what I really want to convey to others when I'm speaking with them is that I'm kind, that I'm full of joy, that I have a lot of energy and I want to be involved, but I don't want to be dominating uh, a conversation or relationship. So I have to think about, well, what, what would a human, you know, what, what are the human aspects of conveying that to somebody. And I have to think about a lot of nonverbal communication in that space. Um, so it's a lot about facial uh, awareness. It's about using hands to communicate to others. Um, and it's about, you know, closeness, which is really kind of difficult uh, in the current moment with the pandemic. So now we have to think about this. And I have a lot of conversations with colleagues about what is proper email etiquette, or not email, Zoom etiquette? First, remember to unmute yourself because that's key. Uh, second is, you know, what's your setting? Um, this is uh, my children's playroom and it's actually counterintuitively, it's, it's uh, intuitively, it's not professional. But counterintuitively, I have found with uh, conversations all around the country um, with colleagues and clients, that it's a great conversation opener. It really lowers tension levels from the get-go. And it conveys that um, while I may be a serious person, I don't take myself so seriously. I like to have fun. I like creative spaces. I like play. Uh, and that says something about who I am and what kind of interaction somebody plans to, to have with me. I had a 15 minute call by way of example yesterday with um, the communications director for uh, the mayor of Salt Lake City. 15 minutes that was some of the most well-used 15 minutes I may have ever had in my life. And it started with a brief conversation about this playroom. So I think setting nonverbal communication, facial expressions, hand gestures go really far in, in, in any space, but particularly in a Zoom context. The second major thing is show, don't tell. What do I mean by that? We often talk about things without ever getting directly to the point of the thing itself. So I've got an example of what telling is, describing something uh, that may have happened, and really showing what that thing is. Um, I wrote this quickly, so it's not maybe my most graceful, but I think it delivers the point. So here's an example of just talking about something. When COVID struck, it was really hard for my business. Staff and sales both suffered. It was just really scary. So that's, that's, that, that conveys a few things, but here's kind of those ideas, you know, showing what that means. When COVID struck, 
my sales plummeted by 30%, which meant my employees and myself, we were all stressed. Some of my employees, uh, I had to lay off. The burden of that responsibility weighed tremendously on my shoulders and on my heart. The lives of those people, my team members, what that meant for them was their rent, their food, their food and their health care were all at stake in ways that a month earlier, none of us ever knew. That's showing about something. That's showing and conveying what fear means. It's about food and housing and health care, things that are quintessential to living a livable life and a joyful life. It's about stress and what that means in terms of the physical body. It weighed on my shoulders, it weighed on my heart. We've all felt that uh, tightness in our chest and in our guts in moments of fear and abrupt change. Uh, being able to relate what that is takes a moment of vulnerability but it's well worth it when you're dealing with your clients or anybody else, because they're gonna take away that, that part of you and that's what they're gonna really remember. They might not remember exactly what you said, but they'll get, they'll remember that you get it. So the third thing is say something true. This one's always harder. I mentioned vulnerability a moment ago. It really takes going into a vulnerable space for yourself and saying something true about your business, whether you are a restaurant or a nonprofit or um, a small boutique clothing store, for example, say you're not just, you're not just those things, right? Those are maybe the, the mechanisms by which you've created a business. But if you're a restaurant, for example, you're a place that provides you know, nourishment and uh, atmosphere and a sp you're holding space for one of the, the, the most meaningful places where people convene and share ideas and uh, really care for each other over a, a, a warm meal, for example. That's true. Saying I'm a restaurant and I, you know, I'm, I'm in the short vine, that's, you know, those are facts. But you want to get to the heart of the thing. We're folks on Ludlow. Uh, my, my daughter and I uh, went into a, a really great boutique shop and we were able to get some, some really nice, uh, yeah, I, got, I picked her up a stuffed animal that she, she adores. Um, you know, what I would say that is true about this place is not that it's just a, a niche a supplier of leather or uh, stuffed animals, but this is a space that provides unique joy to parents and children, to families, to friends, and really anchors uh, a certain corner of Ludlow in, 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 in Clifton. And it's a, it's a place that has deep meaning and isn't, it's, it's irreplaceable. That's something true. Uh, and so those are three examples that go along with what I'm trying to say. Uh, hopefully I've been able to show, instead of just describing what I'm trying to say, hopefully I've been able to speak like a human in doing so. And hopefully I've been able to say something true about why the three, these three key points or key elements of messaging are so important, maybe more now than they ever have been. Um, I think Michelle and I are going to break up uh, the community engagement section. I'll, I'll kick this off with understanding yourself. Because I think the last things that I said about messaging, you really have to do a deep dive into who you are and what your business, what the intention of your business is in the space that you're occupying. Um, and once you figure that out, you're able to move into the next part of understanding your clients. But some key things that you really want to think about in understanding yourself is um, what are you trying to bring to others, not just in terms of product, but what's the meaning that is carried forward with anything from a meal to, um, uh, to the services that you may be providing in Avondale, for example, um, thinking about the Cincinnati Zoo, uh, as, as a major nonprofit in, in the Avondale space. You know, is it just, it's not just about animals. Anytime anybody's ever heard Thane Maynard uh, speak to this, in, for example, in his 90, 90 second naturalist uh, clips, uh, you know, he's conveying the meaning of what the, the zoo means to the community, 
what the animals teach us about who we are, where we've come from, and who we want to be moving forward, not only individually, but as a city, and really at the global scale. You have to really understand yourself, your, the space you occupy, and your relation to yourself and other, between yourself and others to be able to convey that kind of message, which is the heart of who you are to your clients, to your colleagues, and to your friends and family who I imagine again, now more than ever are uh, more meaningful to all of us uh, in, in a moment when uh, social bonds are being you know, stretched thin. Michelle, I would turn it over to you for a moment to, in terms of understanding your clients, or if you have something to respond to the understanding yourself, that's, that's also there. No, I'd, I'd love to talk about understanding your clients. Um, I will say we've been in business here in Cincinnati for six years now. One of the absolute most crucial learning uh, educational moments we've had is just really understanding that every city is unique, every geographic location is unique. But here in Cincinnati, as a small business owner, um, what we found is that relationships matter here more than anything else in growing a business. And, and when I say relationships, I mean sincere and authentic relationships. So when we talk about understanding our clients, that is not to say, do your research and, and message your way in, a set, in such a way that it responds to the research. Research is absolutely incredible. It's pivotal, but it's only one step of understanding your clients. When we say understand your clients, what we're truly speaking about is engaging the community um, and asking them directly, what is it that's important to you? What are you looking for? Um, don't be afraid to develop your ideas and then hold space for change based on that feedback. Um, folks want to know that their voices are heard and that they're heard in an authentic way. So we often encourage our clients to actually meet with the community members from in the areas in which they're opening their business to again, make sure you're part of that community. You're not just coming in and saying, here's what we wanna do for you, here's what we wanna offer. That you are introducing yourself, you're forging a, a, a true relationship and saying, we want to join your community we want to be part of this neighborhood. How can we do that? Come, come with ideas, but also come with an open ear and be open that you may have, you may receive answers that you were on, that were not expected. Um, and that's okay. That's actually going to be the best thing for your business. So one thing that we really promote is um, listening sessions. There are many different approaches. Focus groups are one and they serve a purpose and a valuable purpose. Listening sessions diverge from that in that you are presenting an opportunity for open-ended dialogue. You may have prompts that um, you ask folks, you ask your potential audience or your clients to respond to, but at the end of the day, you are there to welcome their thoughts and to digest them and then respond at a later time. Hopefully that conversation is ongoing as well throughout the duration of, of launching your business as well as continuing to reach out over the time that you are in business. Leo, um, why don't you, I'll kick it back over to you to speak about attending both your needs. Your needs. Yeah, and if I can, I, I just want to emphasize something that you said that was, I think, so important um, just now, which is, and, and, and I'm highlighting it just because I know we had a question um, come in prior to the, to the meeting, and it, and it read, how can you help generate leads for a business? And to that point, like it's perfectly a legit question. A lot of businesses, leads are one of the most important things in terms of building scale and such. Um, that that isn't really you know the path that we take or the path that we found is most sustainable. Um, and in part because leads um, often end up just that. They're leads. Sometimes you're chasing down a rabbit hole, and it doesn't go anywhere. Sometimes it goes somewhere. It's a small project. Maybe it's a bigger project and then it's done and it's over with and you move forward. What we do is we generate relationships and we really focus and encourage um, clients to, 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 um, to think about what's sustainable. How might a client develop a relationship with their clients uh, for the long term? Because that is, that is more dependable for them in the long run. It takes a, li it takes a little bit of more of a lift and more thought um, to kind of go into it on the front end, but 
what we found in our own practice and as well in, in those of our clients is that that is the most sustainable model um, for small businesses because in tough times like we have now, it's, it's, not, it's rarely the leads that get people through, it's the folks that were always there to begin with that continue to come back again and again and again to show their support in, in so many different ways. Um, and maybe that is about attending both your needs um, uh, as a business owner or as a nonprofit, as well as your clients. Um, but it's finding that, that midway, in, in that, that, that piece in the middle, the, the moment where the bridge connects. And you've realized that you found a, a way to reach your client base um, in, in, a, in a meaningful way. Um, that you've communicated who you are, so you've, you've really hooked people. The people that are there, you know they're there because they want to be there. Um, and you're also able to get the things that you need to get done. A lot of small businesses, and we have experience with this for sure, are doing their own accounting, they're doing their own admin, they're doing their own payroll, they're doing all the things themselves. And that takes up a lot of bandwidth. So to the extent that you're able to get those things done and do these other things, eventually, if the relationship sustains and it allows you to build, then you can start to either hire staff or hire other firms, accounting firm, a legal firm, uh, and so on and so forth, to be able to attend some of those other needs. So you don't have to be doing them, but you can be focusing on really developing those relationships um, that work best for you and work best for your clients. So um, not to get our wires crossed, uh, am I kicking this off, Michelle? <laughs> Either way. I'll jump right in if you want. Yeah, yeah, you go ahead. OK. And so everyone knows where we're used to working pretty collaboratively. I think either of us could talk about every one of the um, topics in this presentation. So that's why you'll see us jump back and forth and um, do handoffs throughout. And um, social media is something that directly overlaps with both myself on the creative side of Reverb and Leo on the communication side of Reverb. They work hand in hand and I truly believe that they should for every business in order to be the most successful. Um, first topic we wanted to highlight here is considering your brand. This goes back to where we um, launched our, our conversation initially, which is to say that your brand should encompass everything you want to reflect publicly. It is both about you as a business owner or a, or a team member within a business. It is as much about the individuals behind the business as it is the business's personality um, publicly facing. So you wanna go back to your brand and say, one, what is the color palette that you've established? What tonally does that say about your brand? Are you using electric colors to promote ideas of um, contemporary surges and excitement and, and a frenzy for a younger audience? Are you using really warm grounded palettes that are going to provide comfort and familiarity? Um, what are the fonts you're using? Are your fonts, at the end of the day, readability is absolutely the single most important thing. But beyond that then, what personality does it give you? Are you trying to promote urgency with um, bolder type or, or angled text that moves the eye forward? All of these considerations are interplayed when you're talking about both your brand and your social media presence. And the brand itself in regard to social media can be split from there, from design aesthetic to content pillars. And um, you wanna identify like what are your primary service offerings and then how can you break those down into chapters across your feed? And I'm, I'm, I'm sure Leo will talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but. I have an example pulled up that is just a snapshot of a feed from one of our clients, which is um, Hey, I'm Here. Hey, I'm Here is a youth-led digital group um, who are promoted to changing the conversation around mental wellness and substance use disorders. It's led by young people. It's for young people. They named it. They helped develop the brand. They're, they weigh in on every decision, similarly to hey, Hear Me Out, which we spoke about earlier. What you see on the feed this feed is intended to catch the eye of young adults. 
we did, um, we conducted workshops and how research and listening sessions that had them actually scroll their, through their feed and identify what are the visuals that stop them that get their attention. And then we took that across the sampling of all these young folks and created a brand based on it. So it is a, a direct um, evolution of the core logo, the name Hear Me Out, or Hey I'm Here, I'm sorry, the name Hey I'm Here. And it's meant to both convey fun and action-oriented visuals, but also promote really, really authentic and thoughtful content. So Leo, if you can talk a little bit about knowing your geography and content pillars, that would be great. Yeah, no, that and that was a, that was a great um, kind of intro to all of this. And so, knowing your geography, people always think about, and and I and I think in terms of social media, Facebook and and Instagram and other platforms are really focused on physical geography, right? Um, but you really got to know your social geography too, right? It's not, and Michelle touched on this, what's the demographic? What, are, what is the demographic audience you're trying to reach? So for us, it was about young people, it was about young adults and, and youth under 18, between 13 and 18, with this um, example that we have pulled up. And so I'm neither Michelle or, or I, are, either of us are clearly in that demographic category. So while we could certainly come up with things that are, you know, we thought would hit well in terms of everything from the messaging to the, to the, um, the visual branding. Uh, we didn't think that was appropriate. And, and this is really our MO. We, um, when we fall outside of our lived experience expertise space, we don't try to fake that actually. We find the experts themselves. And so this is also about mental health and substance use disorder. Michelle said that. Um, it's about general, you know, overall well being. And so we needed to find folks that were in that space, either um, struggling in that space on the front end, uh, deep in that space and kind of okay. And some, some of the folks were on the, the back end of solving some, some kind of key um, uh, mental health and, 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 and emotional well-being things that, that were previously uh, kind of issues for them. Um, and we brought those, the ideas together from all corners of the state of Ohio, uh, from rural to, to urban, and um, across, again, across from the age 13 to age 24, 25, uh, which is, there's a certain, there's a lot of developmental stages that a person goes through in that space. You may hear my daughter, who's uh, seven in the background, uh, speaking of developmental stages. Um, and so, you know, so it's about that social geography. It was about the physical geography. It was about thinking about where we would place these, the, the social media um, uh, posts, um, who's using what platform, uh, so digital geography as well. Um, and knowing your own capacities. Not everybody's going to be able to travel all over to gather insights, um, but you can leave kind of quick, uh, quick note cards, um, you know, out, for example, in, uh, if you have a table or a, a, a greeting area or something like that, you can do, you can do kind of quick surveys to gather information uh, about the, the clients or the people that you, you, that you show up every day to serve. Um, and so, and, and so in thinking about this as a, in, in terms of geography as a suite as well, um, and nesting the messaging in with the visuals. For us, the pillars here were kind of threefold. We wanted to make sure that we were, um, that we were developing community. So we have commu community focused messaging here, like the first uh, image, share your story, featuring Elizabeth. Um, and then we had we have a shout out in the central area, uh, Coffee, Hip Hop and Mental Health, which was a, um, a podcast that, uh, that we did to, to both highlight this brand, but also elevate the, the, the brand of the podcast as well. So it was a, a collaborative partnership. And again, going back to developing relationships um, 
as a as a format for sustainability. Um, so that's those are about that's about community. We also wanted to end stigma with you know it, we can't end stigma, but we're pushing back against that. We're, you know, there's a lot of stigma in mental health in a lot of different communities, and there shouldn't be. Now, if there is, but there shouldn't be, and so we're pushing back against that. So you know, sharing your story ends that because one of the key aspects of stigma is it forces us inward. And you, right in the moment when you should be turning outward to your friends and other support systems that, that are possibly there in place. And the digital landscape is also a, a you know, breeding ground for bullying. And we, we knew that. It's a very dangerous space, particularly for young people and in general, and particularly for young folks it, who are suffering through some sort of mental or emotional distress. So we, by sharing this one story in an appropriate way, in, in a real way, then that cuts back on stigma, it generates, it develops community um, at kind of at the same time. And another thing we were talking about here was uh, we wanted to be, we wanted, we wanted this to be sustainable over the long run. And we wanted folks to know that change doesn't happen in a straight line. There's no starting here and getting up here. It, sometimes we have good, good days or good weeks or good months or good years. And sometimes we have less great days or, or months or years. And the idea isn't that every day is excellent, but that over time, what you see is a gain. And it's not easy. It's a practice, it's a journey, but that's, that's the thing that we're trying to convey here. So thinking about you're you know, keeping the focus on you, you can only control you, um, it doesn't happen overnight. That's all part of that messaging. And it's all about the geography, both in terms of digital landscapes, social landscapes, um, uh, uh, ge ge geographic landscapes for sure, and time as well. Being cognizant of my own time uh, and the time that we all have here together, I'm gonna pause there. So I'll go ahead and close out this section by reminding you that consistency is key here. Um, again, it goes back to brand development. Everything you do comes, everything you do relates back to consistency, consistency, consistency. Know what you're offering, know your audience, assess and understand their key needs and how they best access information and then loop it back. Um, I'll share one more slide. Before I do, I also want to just say, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but we have a Q&A panel included. Um, I know that webinars can be difficult because you can't actually volunteer your voice, but there, are, there is an opportunity there that if you have questions as we're all presenting, please go ahead and enter your questions in the Q&A, and there will be an opportunity where, where Brooke will open up questions um, after each presenter is complete. Can so, I say something really quickly too, Michelle? Yeah. I mean, to that point, um, can you go back one slide? Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was that, uh, we received one question earlier on, again, what are three components of a su successful social media cam campaign? And so I just want to acknowledge that question. And uh, just to, you know, hopefully this is, you know, our take on that. Um, so, but it, you know, we could go deeper. So if there are follow-up questions, um, such as that to, to that question, please feel free to submit those in, in either the, the Q&A box or for follow-up later on. And in the effort to just unpack that question a little bit further as I um, show this slide, this is an example of some of the content that, went, that goes along with the post for, um, for Hayon here. And we wanted to include it so you can see how those primary content pillars take form. Um, the goal of social media is not to take the place of a business or to take the place of a website. It's to further enrich the conversations in order to link back. So what I should have said about Hayon here up front as a case study, as an example, is that the primary purpose of Hayon here is actually to link people back to a resource directory that has providers across the state um, for all ages, all counties, all types of service offerings that relate to mental wellness and substance use disorders. 
yes, there is a website and our social media feed could have that listed on every single page, but that wouldn't actually enrich the conversation. So we're using social media here and with other clients as a means to create more of a rich understanding of what's available, drive needs, and also create communities that will help self-promote those resources at the end of the day. Rather than us saying, here's what you should do, we're offering an opportunity for youth to engage with their own peers and come up with those answers together with the support of this feed. So what you see in front of you are two of the different content pillars um, brought to life. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see that there are four primary content pillars that were determined by about 150 youth that we have spoken with and met with as being the most important ways to engage their peers. Storytelling was one that Leo touched upon a little while ago. We um, spotlight individuals with lived experience that want to talk about what those experiences have looked like in their life, how they have found support, and what support looked like to them. Um, and then on the right hand side, you'll see three examples of action and resource oriented posts. Within that content pillar, we are actually providing specific resources. Um, so organizations like Crisis Text Line, who offer immediate 24 7 support. We want to make sure that gets in the hands of individuals. Uh, we want to encourage direct links back to the web website. So we want to encourage people to talk to their peers and find safe supports. Um, it's a great example of how social media can, again, be used to enrich the conversation. So going back to that question of three primary goals, I'd say I personally would lift up two of them as visibility and engagement. So I will, I know we're getting tight on time here and I want to be, I'm very excited to hear Monty speak as well. So Leo, if you could just talk a little bit, close us out um, and talk about our new normal and the importance of response and timeliness. Yeah, well, I would say, what I would say is just to kind of bring us back through what we talked about really quickly is you know, the, the, the theme that I think runs through it is relationships, build those. You do that by being true and thoughtful about who you are and why you're showing up every single day and by being detail oriented and thoughtful about a, a range of things for sure, but, um, but certainly how you're conveying a, a message and the key messages of, of whatever product or service you're providing um, clients in the uptown area, um, you're being very thoughtful about how you're going about doing that. And we have to get a little bit creative these days because we're in a moment where we're being asked for the greater good um, as well as our own individual, um, you know, the good for each individual to do something that's not natural to who we are as a species, really, to be antisocial. We're being asked to break apart the bonds that really connect us. And so what we have to think about, and I think what really is helpful for smaller businesses to think about is how some of these practices um, that we've talked about you know, over the last 45 minutes, how they can nest in with some of the things that you're already doing. Um, because the realities are, especially the smaller businesses, some are, you know, with, with one our sole proprietorships. Some just have a few employees. Others certainly have more resources, but even with them, th there are limited resources. And these are um, uncertain times. The economy is struggling, uh, there's social unrest, and uh, there's political upheaval. People are being pretty conservative, I think, with the things that they still have right now. And so I think the idea is to how to do that as well as continue to open up and maybe explore a new aspect of, of what your business can mean, not only for you, certainly for you, but for the community, for the uptown community in general. Um, because it's together that you're, I mean, this sounds maybe a little trite, but it's true. Uh, it's together that you're going to thrive. Uh, it's by figuring out how to work with each other to support each other, but also to support the needs of your clients. Um, the, the, I, a quick example comes to mind. Um, 
Molly Wellman, who's tremendously popular, um, it, when, when her bar had to, to close down, um, she thought about, well, what could she be doing um, in the meantime? And she went virtual by, and was doing, uh, started giving lessons on cocktails um, that a lot of people really tuned into. And it wasn't really about people needed to know exactly how to make a certain cocktail that Molly Wellman uh, had perfected. It was about how could she, this was her impetus, how could she draw community together um, and, and reach people that were scared, that were suffering, um, and that, uh, you know, that didn't know what a future held for them or anybody else? How could they, she draw them together and keep them present for a moment uh, or a few moments to, to get herself as well as all of us through? And that's a really good example or a model uh, for all of us. And I think that you know, we all can try to implement that some days better than others, but I think that's what Michelle and I are really trying to talk about. And, and here's what's the takeaway with that. We expect clients, we expect to try to be there for our clients. It's easy to do that in, in good times, and it's easy for our clients to be there for us in good times. And this is why relationships matter. It's not easy, it, and it's most meaningful at the same time to be there for our clients in the hard times. And clients will remember that. They will remember which businesses showed up for them in the moment of need. And if now isn't that time, then I don't know when that time is. So that's the key, I think. Great. Well, thank you uh, so much, Leo and Michelle, for speaking with our audience today. I think the information that you provided will be so valuable as people just think about where they are now and how they can incorporate some of the suggestions that you all have offered into what they're doing now. Um, and I think it was very relatable. So I appreciate both of you on here today. And it uh, looks like we don't have any more questions submitted to the Q&A or chat at this time. We did have a question about will the presentation uh, or the webinar be recorded and I answered that. So yes, we are recording this so that we can post it to our YouTube page so that you can view it afterwards. Thank you all, you know, all of you, I've only seen one maybe drop off. So thank you all for staying on and staying engaged. Um, I've also put in the chat, I wanted to mention, I put a link to a form we are offering one-on-one -on -one virtual consulting services with Reverb and Pixels and Dots uh, following the workshop today. Um, it, these are open to up to 20 businesses in the Uptown neighborhoods. And the meetings will include two hours with the business, including an audit of the current business practices and recommended solutions. So if you're enjoying what you're hearing today and you think that you could use some first personal one-on-one -on -one assistance after this workshop, I highly recommend that you click the link in the chat and sign up. I know some of you already have, so thank you for that. Well, thank you, Leo, Michelle. Uh, we'll quickly turn it over to Monty. Let's get him on here real quick. There we go. I think we unmuted you. All right, awesome. So Monty, if you wanna kick us off and you'll be speaking on uh, search engine optimization and e-commerce, so it's buying and selling goods online. And I know we have a lot of people in Uptown that either have a website, don't have a website. They're looking to um, increase their sales. And so I'm really excited for what you have to share as well. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. And I wanted to say thanks to the Uptown Consortium and to PNC Bank for inviting me to this workshop and to my colleagues at Reverb for uh, starting off this workshop today. And again, my name is Monty Davis. I am a partner at Pixels and Dots. We're a digital marketing and uh, creative design agency in Cincinnati. And today I'm going to share with you some information about search engine optimization and some of the tools that I use for search engine optimization on a daily basis. And also I'm going to speak about e-commerce and some of the platforms that are out there that could help you uh, with starting a new business online. 
I'm going to share my screen now. Looks great. What's that? So the first thing I wanted to talk about was how Google ranks websites these days. They take into account four different focus areas, and they are trust, authority, relevance, and user behavior. And what they're looking for is content that has, uh, that can be relied that's relevant and uh, reputable backlinks on that content. As far as authority, they want uh, sites to have strength in their overall market. And they want to have a strong social media following for those sites. For relevance, again, it's content needs to be relevant to what the search that's being performed is looking for. And then your website has to have really great user behavior in regards to people staying on your site and digesting the content and not bouncing off of your site right after landing on the page. So these are really the areas that Google's now focusing on. And they're really important as far as building your site and working on your SEO. And next are some of the strongest factors of reaching the top 10 search results are going to be your web traffic, how much traffic you're receiving to your website, what your click-through rate uh, looks like as far as people, once they see the search results and clicking through and going to your site, the amount of time that the web users stay on your website is really important. And again, your bounce rate, which is just how long people stay if they just click on your uh, search result link, take a quick peek at your site and then leave. That's not a good thing. You want to have better engagement with the user and you want to have a low bounce rate. Uh, Google's also looking at the number of quality backlinks that you have on your website. Our, our backlinks and actually I mean links coming into your website from other websites that have high authority. There's going to be backlinks coming in. That's really important that you link with websites that are uh, related to your content. And there's some reason that it would make sense for a user to, for you to be connected to that other website. It can't just be random. It shouldn't be something that's unrelated. It really needs to be something related to the content on your website. And uh, you definitely have to have a, SSL digital certificate. Uh, Google really wants all the sites to be encrypted. And uh, that's pretty easy to do these days. You can get free encryption through a service called Let's Encrypt through most web hosting companies. Uh, and if you're an e-commerce site, you'd want to go to a digital certificate authority and uh, buy a certificate like uh, one would be like Komodo or Global Sign, another one. Uh, again, content relevance is really important. Total uh, social media activity is important. They want you to have a lot of social media activity and be connected and set up with profiles for all the different social media uh, pro uh, areas that would be relevant to you. This next slide uh, has a screen capture from the Google Search Console. That's uh, something that I set up relatively early in my search campaigns for clients. It is uh, part of Google where you can uh, check out the performance of your website, look for errors in your website. This uh, graph that we're looking at now shows uh, the last uh, three months of activity on my site and it's just showing how many clicks we had, how many total impressions, average click-through rate, average positioning for keyword phrases. It's all really good information to have. And uh, it's a great tool to use. I go in for my clients all the time and check out, find errors and uh, 
things that need to be corrected. You can upload a site map for your website so that uh, Google knows where to look and find your site map and then can go and visit that site map and help get your pages indexed. This next slide is from Google Analytics. It's another screen capture and it um, is another, it's a free tool. Uh, Google Search Console is free also. You just have to go in and verify your domain name. But Google Analytics, I think everyone's probably familiar with uh, the name, but uh, this is a screen capture that shows you uh, a graph of my site content and the behavior that users have had with my site content, the number of page views. You can see towards the bottom, <clears throat> unique page views, average time on page, entrance page, uh, number of entrances, bounce rate, a lot of really great information. Uh, I use this to monitor websites for my clients, but also to generate reports. It's really a good tool to create um, performance reports, traffic reports, so that you can see how your SEO is doing and how your traffic is increasing and also helps you to find a lot of unique information that, that you might not even know about, which is great, like incoming links and where your traffic is coming from. It's a great tool to use. I'm going to uh, share with you a couple of different tools that I use on a regular basis uh, for SEO. This is one of them. It's called Screaming Frog. It has a free version, so you can go out and pick that up or download that. And um, it works great. It's a really good tool to use for your own website and to also do competitive research and finding out information about websites that already ranking for keyword phrases that you'd like to rank for, and they're already up in the search results. On this uh, example, you can see if you look underneath the address bar, there are tabs that say like internal, external, security, response goods, URL, page titles, meta descriptions, meta keywords. You can go through each of those tabs and see the different information uh, for all of the web pages on your website. The free version goes up to 500 uh, links that you can analyze. Uh, there is a pay version. I think it's about $200. Um, but the free version works really great if you want to scan a website and get some uh, competitive analysis going. You can look at all the titles at a glance for all the web pages. So you can see keyword phrases, H1 tags. Uh, it's just a really great tool and I highly recommend it. I use it every day. Another tool that we use every day is SEMrush. And this is a pay for tool. It's I think $100 a month. But this is another excellent tool for doing competitive research and for analyzing your web content and getting, uh, finding areas that need improvement on your web pages for on page SEO. Um, this tool is great. You can go, it'll suggest to you um, that you need to add content to certain pages that might not have enough content text, uh, add H1 tags, really helps you to learn what you need on your web pages and also to just find places that need improvement and to really keep up on your uh, website. It also has features for checking backlinks so you can find out where your backlinks are coming from really easily. You can find out whether those backlinks are quality backlinks or if they may be toxic and they might be better off removed from your or blocked so that they're not bringing you down as a uh, search criteria. You can do keyword overview. You can 
do a link building tools. Uh, you can see that left-hand column with that navigation, there's a lot of different features that you can uh, jump into. About that This tool, again, use it all the time. And it's also great for competitive analysis because you can just plug in a competitor's domain name and see all the same information uh, that I was describing. Same thing with uh, Screaming Frog. You can put in a competitor's domain name, see all the information on their website, up to 500 links unless you have the paid version. As far as uh, keyword research and determining which keywords you want to have on your website, there's a great site it's referred to as Ahrefs. It's ahrefs.com. Uh, they have a trial version on their website as well. It's a seven days free trial. <clears throat> you do have to put in payment information, but you can then go in and perform uh, queries on keyword phrases. Uh, this one that we're looking at, uh, I just typed in web design to get a peek at uh, what the information would look like. Uh, some of the data that you can see here are the keywords that come back that are related to the keyword phrase that I put in. Some of these are a little off, but they, they're still close. And then uh, over on the right-hand side of the graph, there's um, keyword difficulty. Is that KD? It tells you how competitive the keyword phrases are. So the higher the number, the more competitive the phrase is going to be. So if you have a number of keyword phrases that you're considering to uh, start SEO um, work on, you can check them out and see how competitive they're going to be and see how much traffic is coming to those different, coming through from those different uh, keywords to click throughs. They also give you an estimate of uh, cost per click pricing. I don't know how accurate that really is. I haven't used that, but I uh, used that on there as well. Um, but this is really another really good tool for finding keyword phrases. It, it works great. Next, I would like to talk a little bit about, about on-page SEO. And on-page SEO is when you're actually making changes to content, text, images, and elements on your website. Uh, meta tags are part of on-page SEO, uh, your meta description, your title tags, HTML tags like uh, H1 tags, alt tags. They're really important to uh, make sure that all of those are filled out. Uh, again, meta tags need to always be filled out too. A title is very, very important as far as uh, search engines go ranking and uh, indexing your pages. You always want to um, have internal links using keyword phrases. For uh, images and videos, you want to optimize those by making sure that they are sized appropriately as far as resolution goes and also physical size that you're not scaling down an image so it's actually 500% size when it really needs to just be scaled down. Uh, you would want to make sure you've got, again, your alt tags for all the images, your title tags for your images and videos. Make sure that those are always optimized. Videos optimization would also be compression, making sure that it's compressed so that it uh, will load quickly and uh, play quickly off the bat and hopefully not have a lot of latency uh, on start. Your page load speed is really important. You want to make sure, again, that every graphic is optimized and sized appropriately so that it will load as fast as possible. You uh, want to make sure your scripts, JavaScript files, are minified so that there are no white spaces in the scripts. That's important. It helps the load speed as well. Another uh, on-page SEO is your XML sitemap, making sure that that is 
uh, set up and upload it to your website. And a robots text file will also help with your on-page SEO. You want to make sure that you are informing the search engines on which content you would like to have indexed and which content you would not like that indexed. And give them directions on that. The next slide's on off-page SEO, which is uh, link building where you're reaching out to relevant websites that are similar or have some of the same interests of your website and requesting backlinks so that they will link, put a link on their website to your site. You want to make sure they have uh, good domain authority and that they are quality backlinks coming in. We would also do directory submissions where you're going to submit your website to quality directories so that uh, you're out there, your URL will be indexed through a directory. People can find you. It's a great way to get another backlink coming in as long as it's a quality directory. Article writing is another good way to get some off-page SEO where you write an article and submit it to another website or blog and ask them to, to post the article and have backlinks coming to uh, your website. Photo editing and video sharing is another way you can get some good off-page SEO. You share photos, share videos with other uh, websites and have them again post back to you. Forum and blog commenting. Any way you can get your URL out uh, on a quality site linking back to you is going to really help for your off-page SEO. It's going to bring in more traffic and give you uh, better authority as long as they're quality links. Guest blogging, again, doing a guest post for a blog brings in another backlink to social media. RSS feeds are great if you can get another uh, website to bring in an RSS feed from your website onto their website and post and it's going to generate, you know, all of your posts and links to interior pages of your website. That would be another great way to get some really good off-page SEO. Local SEO is, I think, where a lot of people uh, have been focusing lately. And I, I think it's a, a great place to start uh, for finding and generating leads that are close by. We, we do a lot of local SEO optimization. And uh, we start off by setting up Google My Business for our clients. And we make sure that when we go into Google My Business that we are filling out all of the profile. So you wanna make sure that you get in there and fill out everything you can. You can upload photos, make sure you upload photos, make sure that you enter your hours of your website. You can upload a video. You can actually do posts from Google My Business. So you could just do a post and talk about a current project or something that's happened in the news. The more activity um, and the better your profile is set up, the better uh, you will be in Google's eyes. They really want you to make sure that you've optimized your profiles for Google My Business. So get in there and do that. That's a, that's a great job. Uh, place to start getting your local SEO and showing up in the local uh, search results. On your website for some on-page local SEO, you would want to post some case studies, uh, possibly of projects that you've done within the region. Also testimonials from your clients that are local will also help to generate uh, confidence in people that are searching and looking at your website. 
you want to establish brand authority in your area uh, so that people believe that you are you know the best and you want them to, to come to you and you want them to be engaged and click through or fill out a form you want to have them convert into becoming a customer uh, NAP is you want to make sure this is really important that you have your name address and phone number on your website for local SEO because Google uses that information for the regular organic search results and also for uh, voice search and finding if someone asks for a business near me uh, they're going to look and find that uh, name and address that's already been indexed but you must have it on your website to get there i was working with a client recently they didn't have their name and address and phone number on their website because a lot of their uh, they do a lot of referrals through word of mouth and they just didn't have their name address and phone number i was shocked but i, I got that on their form so that really helped uh, the UX, um, the user experience for your website is really important. You want it to be a nice, clean, fast loading website that uh, will work great on mobile devices and you want um, to be able to be searchable for transactional search queries where uh, local SEOs are people looking for either uh, places or services that they would like to find. So. It's really good to have great user experience. Having a video on your uh, website is another good way to help with your local SEO, having an instructional video, informative video, and uh, having an FAQ section to help educate your audience is really helpful too, to answer questions that they may have so that they can gain as much information about your services and your business uh, before reaching out to make sure that they know you're a good fit for each other. So content's really important uh, for SEO. I, I think uh, that's been around for a while. Everyone knows that you, know, you want to have really great content on your website. I'm going to give you a few writing tips on how to write better content for SEO. Uh, one of the best ways to uh, build your content is to write naturally and use simple writing. Uh, they recommend that your website be written on an eighth grade level so that it's really easy to understand by everyone. So it's really important to make that simple writing and it's also really good to create or try to create unique copy and use ideas and write on topics that are related to your services and business, but that are new and fresh that haven't been uh, written on. So you're not just rewriting the same kind of content that someone else has already spent time on. You wanna make sure that yours is unique and that it adds value so that when Google spiders your website and sees the content, they're going to recognize it as quality content and hopefully you'll rank higher, or you'll get better uh, you know, indexing. You wanna make sure that your page uh, title for your page is click worthy. And by that, I mean the title of your page, uh, when you write that, um, needs to have either like a call to action or some sort of way to engage the person searching the website through Google or any other search engine uh, because the title's used um, as the very first line of the search result and they're gonna see they're gonna see that first and they're gonna read it and then you're gonna want them to you know click through and you want to be click worthy. You want to have your keyword, your primary keyword for your web page in your metadata. You usually want to create one dedicated web page for each keyword phrase you want to rank for. And you're going to want that in your metadata and in your title and have that keyword for a uh, keyword or phrase also in the first sentence of your 
content, your copy, your text on the website. You would also want to create an HTML H1 tag and wrap that around your keyword that you would like to rank for. That's really important. And you'd want to have uh, links using your keyword on the page also that link to different pages within your website or to other pages that could be external pages as well. Back to titles, you want to keep your titles of your website to 65 words or less. Um, that's the most characters that you, I mean, yeah, 65 characters, I shouldn't say words, sorry, that's a mistake. 65 characters is uh, uh, how long you want the title to be. And no longer because it'll just be truncated in the search results. So make sure that your titles are short and descriptive. You should also use synonyms for your keywords on your website. That's really important. Um, Google looks at related words on your website that are related to your keyword phrase. And you want to use um, conceptually related terms. You want to make sure that your text is scannable. So when you write, you would want to write shorter paragraphs, maybe three sentences in length. And then you can break up your paragraphs with bulleted lists or numbered lists. And then uh, you want to make sure that you probably have about 500 uh, words of copy on the page. You can go more if you want. Um, just to put some of the SEO tools that I mentioned earlier will suggest or look and analyze other web pages and say your competitors have a thousand keywords. I mean, a thousand words of body copy, and you only have 500 words of body copy. You need to add 500 more. So, I, but I would say 500 would be a great place to start. You don't want to go with just like 100 or really short. It's not going to be enough copy. You want to have enough content on the page um, so that Google will take you as a serious page to index. Image optimization, um, one, uh, there's a tool, it's called Optimizilla, it's out there. If you're not sure on how to compress your images using an image editor like Photoshop, uh, you can go out to Optimizilla and upload your high resolution photos and it will compress those photos and then you can download those. I think there's a limit of 20 uh, photos per optimization. But you want to make sure your images are uh, low resolution, 72 DPI. And you want to make sure they're the proper size. I mentioned that earlier. You don't want to put in an image uh, that's 2,000 pixels wide and then size it down to being 200 pixels. Uh, you want to size the physical size of that image down in Photoshop. So you want to make sure that your images are physically sized properly and the resolution size is set up properly. You should use unique relevant images uh, on your page. You don't want to have images that are unrelated to the content of your website. And you want to use high quality images as well. And use descriptive file names for your images. So you'd want to use keyword phrases in the file names if possible, but uh, use a file name that describes the photo. Again, make sure they have all tags and title tags for those images in your HTML. And um, I would recommend using JPEGs or PNG files because they have uh, really good compression schemes. WordPress is a really popular content management system that's used by many websites that are out there. And there's a really great plugin called Yoast uh, for SEO. And on the screen right now, I've got a couple of screen captures from Yoast to show you, in case you've not seen it, um, how it looks 
and give you an idea of how it works. On the left side, um, you can see uh, a snippet preview of your web page. The way, the way this plugin works is when you go to edit a web page in WordPress, near the bottom of the page, you will see the Yoast plugin as long as you install the plugin, of course, into WordPress. But um, at the bottom of the page, you'll see these areas, these screen um, captures. And for they're specific to the web page that you're on and editing, but it'll show you the screen snippet pre or the snippet preview, which is how your search result is going to look when it gets uh, indexed in Google. So you can actually have a preview where you can see what your title is going to look like, what the URL is going to look like, and what the meta description will look like. So you would use this tool to go in and enter meta descriptions and titles <clears throat> for your web pages. And it's a great tool to get a really good look at how it's going to look and then it also gives you um, suggestions or comments and says uh, your title's still not long enough. You need to <clears throat> still create a little long or it's too long. Um, it's great if you got WordPress. It's a free plugin. You can download it. There's also a paid version, but the free version works pretty well. You can go in and start. If you follow the directions from uh, Yes, it's going to help you significantly if you don't have any yet on on page SEO right now, it's just a great tool you can go and start using today. The right hand column of my screen is showing um, analysis results from Yoast for uh, the different features that you can optimize with Yoast and like outbound links, internal links, key phrase and in introduction, key phrase link. And at the top, there's a little smiley face that's green when you first start with Yoast, you're, and if your web pages are not optimized, it'll show a red uh, frowny face, and then it'll go to an orange face when you're partially there, and then finally you'll end up on a green happy face when you've got your web page optimized uh, in a good way. And um, it, it's a really great tool for helping out and really learning about SEO and, and getting your on page SEO going. So, Google uh, uses a feature called uh, rich snippets that you can use on your, uh, you can enter structured data into your website, and then this uh, rich snippets will show up in your search results. Um, and you can do this for uh, ratings for your, um, if you have products or reviews and uh, the price of a product. It's a lot of um, for products. And you can also have breadcrumbs that show where you are on the website, which is great. And I'll show you the structured data and how you can get this, um, these features to show up in, in two slides from now. But uh, rich snippets are um, another great way to show right uh, in the search results your ratings, your reviews, and help to engage clients so that they will click through and visit your website. Uh, rich results are another uh, piece of, um, another way, another result that comes back from the structured data that you can enter on page. Uh, but rich results can be like, an, uh, you could show up in the FAQ rich results for a, a search query that was looking for the answer to a question. And the, these uh, rich results will also be really helpful for, for uh, voice searching which is becoming more and more popular. Uh, I think this ComScore predicts that by the end of 2020, 50% of searches are going to be voice searches through mobile and other uh, devices. And the way you can create and get uh, rich results are through 
<coughs> structured data and you would probably want to get a web developer to help you with this because it's not very uh, friendly looking, but it is, uh, you use this JSON markup language, which is on the right hand side of my screen to give you an idea of how you would type it out. And there are tools out there that you can use on Google that will help you build these uh, snippets, the structured data. And you, th those are helpful if you want to try it on your own. You can go out and just do a search on structured data creation tool. And uh, you copy this code and you paste it onto the page, onto your web page, into the HTML code. And it will then be indexed and searched through Google when the spiders come out and visit your website. And uh, there's many different types of uh, rich results that can be supported, articles, books, breadcrumbs. They can even do a carousel of images where you can have three images or more that just you click through and scroll through. And you're just going to call them out in your uh, structured data and it's going to find the images. It's, it's really pretty interesting the way it works. You can also do uh, courses and um, all kinds of offers. And things. Uh, my last slide on SEO is um, about a new feature in Google. Uh, it's accelerated mobile pages. It's a way to build out web pages so that they will work and uh, great for mobile devices and load really, really quickly. This is something uh, it's more advanced, but uh, it's coming around and bigger websites for bigger companies are using this now, but you would need a team of developers to get this going, but it's something you might be hearing about um, in the future more just as we get more <laughs> into searching with mobile devices and really getting out there. So that, that's the end of my search engine optimization piece. And I will provide links to Rook at Uptown Consortium to the different tools that I spoke about so that you can uh, go out and check those out on your own. And we can uh, see if Rook can post those along with uh, the video. The next uh, area I'm going to speak on, I'm going to grab a quick drink of water first. <clears throat> is getting started with e-commerce. And Brooke had mentioned that um, in Uptown, there were some businesses up there that um, are not involved in e-commerce, but might want to start getting involved in e-commerce uh, now that there's, you know, the foot traffic has gone down and then people are getting out less uh, you know, online uh, e-commerce. Could really be helpful. And I wanted to talk about um, what to think about when you're getting started with e commerce. I've built um, many e commerce websites and spoken with clients that did not have a lot of experience with um, selling online and uh, worked with them to just better understand what kind of commitment you need to make. Um, as far as uh, employees and also budgeting and monetary uh, commitment with the type of e-commerce solution that um, you implement. So I'm going to start off now. A couple of ways to use e-commerce. One, one solution type is a marketplace, which is like Amazon or eBay where you go out and you actually buy from sellers, that uh, a number of sellers, uh, and you can also sell there as a seller, of course. And um, this is, uh, I've not worked with uh, anyone who's ever done these, but I can say that uh, I think that with the Amazon, you, know, you don't really have um, control of your order process and you don't have 
access to the user data, data and same thing with eBay, it would be limited. Uh, so you, you could sell here, but it, it's really not a branded uh, e-commerce solution where your brand is going to grow. You're always going to be relying on uh, the third party, Amazon or eBay in this case. But one thing I do want to mention about Amazon and eBay is that, um, <clears throat> and bigger retail stores like Walmart and Target and places that are out there with e-commerce right now, I, I think that a lot of people have an expectation now of how e-commerce feels and should work. And those uh, types of companies have, they have a large staff of programmers that are working daily on creating the best user experience and uh, checkout process that uh, they can come up with. And it's just to keep that in mind when you're working on your own e-commerce solution that not to have the expectation that everything you see out on Target or Walmart or Amazon is going to be built into any e-commerce solution that you might implement on your own. <laughs> so e-commerce open source solutions are really popular uh, as far as ways to get into e-commerce without creating a custom application from the ground up. Some of the open source solutions that are out there are WooCommerce, which is a WordPress plugin. It's really popular these days. Magento Commerce is a standalone e-commerce application that's owned by Adobe. Uh, PrestaShop is another uh, open source PHP MySQL uh, e-commerce solution and OS Commerce, same thing, PHP MySQL open source. So by open source means that you can download the source code and install it on your website or on a web server and get it up and running uh, as long as you know how to do that, which you would need a team of, uh, of a web developer and a web programmer at least to do uh, some of these solutions. But WooCommerce, uh, again, is free. It's something that you can install into WordPress. And it comes with themes that out of the box you, can, you could get up and running. But there are some limitations to it. And what I want you to be aware of with all of the open source products is that they have modules or plugins that extend the capabilities of the applications. So if you wanted um, a specific promotion, there's probably a module out there that can manage different promotions sales promotions. And then um, there are modules that manage shipping features. But those modules aren't always free. They usually uh, have either a flat rate and often are now becoming uh, annual renewal costs and, and charges. So you pay each year for it's a software as a service payment. Um, but they stay up to date and they keep the, the applications secure and make any patches to them. Um, to give you an idea of pricing, uh, just in case you're interested in having, or you don't know what it would cost to have something developed uh, as an e-commerce solution, WooCommerce within the WordPress application if, if you were to have um, a web development or web design company build you a, a new website in WordPress with WooCommerce installed and configured uh, and had 
products uploaded and everything set up, uh, that could run you $15,000 easily. Magento is a much more robust open source e-commerce solution, that uh, type of, and, and e-com, and Magento, I would say you would probably need a team of five people to manage that website for you even after launch. So you would uh, have someone develop it and get it up and running product entry. That would uh, probably be about $25,000 to do that. And then you would need to consider, and you would need to consider this with all of the websites uh, or e-commerce solutions is that there will be ongoing maintenance with those websites. Uh, so you will be, reaching out to your web developer, programmer, database design person to make changes or updates to your website, at least probably quarterly. Uh, so you want to keep in mind, I'm, I'm just trying to explain that there are different expenses that you may not be thinking of when you're first thinking about e-commerce, but I just kind of want to touch on this. So Magento, like 25,000 plus that ongoing maintenance. Trust Shop and OS Commerce are more in the Woo Commerce, maybe 10,000, 15,000 <clears> to get it up and running. But then again, you're still going to have your ongoing support. Uh, and also the modules that you're going to want to put in and the plugins that are going to help you. Another really popular way to get into e-commerce is using a software as a service solution, which is your Shopify, Squarespace, and for restaurants, there's uh, one after Toast. These are um, nice solutions. If, if you, you, know, you don't have a large enough operation where you could justify um, investing a large you know, pretty good amount of money into just the development of the website and um, the ongoing maintenance. Where with, uh, with these solutions, uh, you're going to pay a monthly subscription fee to have access to a website um, like Shopify. You also have access to themes for the user experience and layout of the look and feel of the website. And uh, again, there's plugins and, and different features that you could extend um, Shopify with. But Shopify is nice because you can have unlimited uh, number of products. You can have unlimited bandwidth and storage on uh, their site. They perform all of the security updates. Uh, you don't have to build the site from scratch. They take care of the security, the PCI compliance piece. Um, and so Shopify, I think, starts, let's see, it's about, has, has different levels of service, which start at about $29, go up to $299 in between. So, but I, I recommend, um, if you are just getting started in e-commerce and want to get a feel for it and you want to be conservative, I would say check out these software as a service solutions and try them out and see if they'll work for you. You, you may not get every bell and whistle that's out there, but I think that uh, as a new user, you won't feel as though you're opening up your wallet, you know, all the time to, to do a, one of the more um, robust open source design your website type of uh, solutions. And Toast is a really, I, I've been seeing that lately just because of COVID and ordering online and doing pickups at website or at restaurants. Often it's a really slick 
application, I would uh, recommend checking out Toast. It's got some pretty reasonable pricing. It's, um, there's different services, but uh, I would take a look at that. It, it's, uh, again, you would get a feature of your um, online ordering, put your menu up with your uh, items, and then they take care of most of, you know, all the back end except for maybe your item entry. But they will also take care of all the security updates and you're just paying a subscription price. And uh, it might be a really good fit for you. And um, Shopify and SquarePay, uh, I think Shopify has a, a card reader if you um, have that e-commerce solution in your store and you have someone or you're out at a, a pop-up store or something and you want to do a, a card transaction, you can do it that way. Uh, when you're getting into e-commerce, you need a payment processor who's going to process the payments that you bring in. And there are a number of them out there. A lot of uh, each um, shopping cart usually covers some of the big players and you can find a module or plugin that you can install that will help you connect to a payment processor. But you need to go to your uh, bank for your business, your business bank, and open up a merchant account and then get your payment processor, PayPal, Stripe, Square, Braintree. These are all different um, payment processors that are out there. They are going to take a percentage of your credit card transactions, usually up to almost 3%. Uh, and they, um, they're all a little different, so you want to take a look at, at those. But things to look for are how quickly is my money funded back to me? Um, that, that's really important to, to know, you know, when, when is your money coming, you know, going to be in. How much do they charge per transaction? So it's usually uh, could be 10 cents up to 30 cents per transaction. They're just going to take a, a, a charge for each transaction. Um, th there's a lot of good ones out there. And uh, when you go to get that merchant account, in order to get your merchant account, you're going to have to make sure that you have policies in place. So you need to think about what your return policy is going to be, what your refund policy would be, terms of service, your privacy statement, uh, how you use cookies and retargeting. A lot of people uh, don't really think about this when they're thinking about e-commerce, but you have to have those policies in place on your website before you will be able to get your merchant account approved for e-commerce. You may already have a merchant account for in-store, but I'm talking about for e-commerce. And uh, the e-commerce solutions that are out there typically have a sample policy for each of these different areas that you can uh, review and modify to your liking. Um, I would recommend you know, having an attorney take a look at it, but uh, you know, I would not recommend just going in and swapping out your name for whatever you know company name is in there. You really want to read through it and make sure that. You know, your refund policy is going to work the way it works for your store. So your website, your e-commerce site is going to need security and encryption. You're going to need to show your you know, web users that your site's secure so that they can have confidence in using their credit card payment method on your site. And you're going to want to have HTTPS or SSL, and, and that's where you see the green padlock or a padlock on your website. The green padlock is a higher end digital certificate, uh, but you would need to go to a certificate authority and purchase a digital certificate. 
and not use one of the free, like the Let's Encrypt, I would not recommend that for an e-commerce site, but go to an actual digital certificate and get um, the certificate there. And that would be like Komodo or Global Sign. Um, you're also gonna need to consider your web server security. So if you're uh, you know, hosting an e-commerce website, someone needs to be paying attention to the security of the web server and that, that may be your web hosting company. You need to talk to them and learn how they're protecting their e-commerce installations from attack. Within your e-commerce solution, you could want to have two-step authentication so that uh, if your password is compromised, that you have a way that um, you're notified if someone's trying to get into the website and you have to provide a second uh, piece of authenticating information. And your site's gonna to need to be PCI compliant and your, um, your uh, merchant account provider can help you with Right, you know, learning about that, and you could also ask your web developer to and find out about you know ways to help get make sure you're PCI compliant. Um, sales tax is another area where a lot of people don't think too much about it, but uh, like within Ohio, you've got 52 different counties with different uh, sales taxes, as well as the state sales tax for the different states in the nation. Different other states have their own counties as well that charge different sales tax amounts. So you're going to want to find a sales tax uh, calculator that you can use with your e-commerce solution, and TaxJar is a really great plugin for that. Let's see, we're kind of running low on time, so I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Promotions, um, and you're going to want to find a plugin that helps you with this. Just don't assume that every type of plugin that you want. It's going to just be a feature of your uh, e-commerce solution. You're going to ask, you, you're going to need to ask questions uh, and find out what's available and what it's going to cost to get different uh, promotions implemented. Shipping providers this is another area where you're going to have to find a, a shipping provider and it's also going to take time and money to get your product shipped out of your uh, location. Uh, it's another thing to, to keep in mind. And you're going to want to know how you're going to get your shipping labels printed. If you're going to have in-store pickup, how's that going to work? How you're going to calculate real-time shipping? There's a lot of things to think about with your shipping. Uh, accounting and inventory. You're going to need a person that's going to help you with that as well. That's another time-consuming piece of e-commerce. Having a shop admin. You're going to have to have somebody that's paying attention to the product management, the order management, who's going to manage your customer service, <clears throat> running reports, and who's going to manage the promotions that are on the website. Web development and programming, we talked about this. You're going to need people that are going to have to help you uh, with things unless you go with that service as a software solution type. The others you're going to need web developers, programmers. And again, your shop admin is going to have to uh, help you with your product, creating your product types, getting your simple products entered, configurable products or products with attributes, size, color. You're going to have to put together a, pr a spreadsheet of all your products and you're going to have to get together your product photos. I would recommend using uh, high-end quality photos for your products so they're more engaging. Your uh, order management, uh, are you gonna have packing tickets that you can create? You know, are you gonna have order fulfillment? You're gonna be able to uh, have a fulfillment center, probably not in the beginning, but you're gonna need to figure out how you are gonna fulfill your order so you can get them out on time so your customers aren't uh, upset with the delivery times. Uh, and then again, reporting, you want to find out what kind of reporting is going to be available for your solution. Are you going to get sales reports, your conversions on your website, your traffic? Don't just assume that you're going to have reporting features. You want to know and ask questions up front and find out what's going to be available.
Um, you're going to need a plan for how you're going to drive traffic to your website through search engine optimization. You can blog post uh, flash sales on your products, uh, social media advertising, and you can also do things like paperclip to generate traffic to your site. And some ways on how to make conversions on your website. You can use uh, their sales funnel modules and tools out there that you can use, buy now buttons, uh, flash sales where you're discounting items uh, for a limited time. There's a lot of things you want to think about before you start to engage a developer and before you get involved. Try to think these things through, just have at least a general idea of what you're wanting to do so that you're not caught off guard and you're not uh, surprised that there might be a cost for, for some of uh, what you're looking to do. And also just be ready for fraud. People are going to try and hack e-commerce sites. They are doing it all the time. But just some things to keep in mind or you know, learn about what your fraud protection is. Pay attention to the orders that are coming in. If you get odd requests for orders, like uh, shipping to another location, shipping to another country, if they ask you about a different type of payment uh, type, like if they, can they pay by check, or um, it's an unusual large amount of product ordered, or they request an extremely fast turnaround time. That's a, another thing to, to watch for. And just to pay attention and think, it, you know, if anything seems odd, to maybe take a second look at it. Okay, with that, that is the end of my uh, dual <laughs> presentation. And I'm going to switch it back over to Brooke. Hey, Brooke, I'm just going to flag that I believe you're still muted. Thank you. That was going on for a, a long minute there. <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, Monty's presentation will, uh, Monty's and Michelle's and Leah's presentation, we will get those emailed out to the attendees as well as we've recorded this presentation. I also wanted to note that it looks like we didn't have any more questions submitted. Looks like every question was answered, a lot of detailed information. Um, and the link in the chat will take you directly to the form that you can fill out to sign up for one-on-one -on -one consulting sessions. If you joined us for the second hour and it looks like a few people did, I saw some new faces pop on. I wanted to remind everyone of the one-on-one -on -one virtual consulting services that we are offering through this partnership with PNC. And these sessions will take place over Zoom. They will be virtual with the businesses and each business will be um, given two hours of uh, availability with the firm. So we will match you up depending on what topic you're most interested in. So check out that intake form in the chat box. And we're right at our time, about 3.58 today. So thank you so much, uh, Monty and Michelle. It looks like we just had someone say thank you guys um, so much for presenting and providing your industry expertise. Uh, we really appreciate it. And with that, I will wrap up today's session. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you.